Good morning. My name is Brad Cornell. I'm the COO with the Olathe Chamber of Commerce. Also, also with us from our office this morning is Susie Carson. She's our Vice President of Membership Investments. Susie's going to help us with field questions, keep us with time management, and just keep us on track this morning. We want to welcome everybody to our Friday Zoom meeting. We hope everybody is staying safe and continues to be well. Today's call is possible thanks to our sponsor, First National Bank of Omaha. The Olathe Chamber of Commerce is committed to providing timely, relevant information. Today, our focus is on updating our, is an update on our upcoming general election. At this point, I'd like to turn the call over to Latham Scott. Latham is the Vice President of Commercial Banking with First National Bank of Omaha to tell us a little bit about his bank and to introduce today's speakers. Latham. Thanks a lot, Brad. Uh, my name is Latham Scott. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Olathe Chamber of Commerce for offering First National Bank of Omaha, or FNBO, the chance to sponsor this important Zoom session on elections, and for you for taking the time to join us. FNBO has been in the Johnson County market for over 25 years, has grown to seven locations, and remains excited about future growth in the market. FNBO remains the largest privately held bank in the U.S. with nearly $24 billion in assets. We are on our sixth generation of family leadership since our founding in 1857, and the family remains committed to the communities the bank serves. Throughout the many years in business, FNBO has weathered many economic storms and stood by our customers during great depressions, great recessions, and now as we wade through the COVID-19 pandemic. As of this month, FNBO has provided nearly $4 million in community investment to address the impacts of COVID-19. In addition, the bank provided over 7,300 businesses with more than $800 million in PPP loans that helped preserve an estimated 90,000 jobs throughout our footprint. We remain a proud member of the Johnson County community and look forward to continuing our history of service here. With that, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. I'll begin um, with Scott Schwab. Scott grew up in Great Bend, Kansas, graduated from Fort Hayes State University, and prior to entering public service, he was a small business owner and a national sales trainer for a Fortune 50 company in the pharmaceutical industry. Scott was first elected to the Kansas House of Representatives in 2002, where he worked to bring local control and funding to Kansas schools, while also supporting free enterprise to strengthen the economy. As chairman of the House Elections Committee, a leadership role he held for four years to safeguard Kansas elections and the voting process. Uh, while, while he held that role, he championed several pieces of election policy to safeguard Kansas elections in the voting process. Scott also served in other Kansas, leader, Kansas House leadership roles. Scott was elected to his first term as Kansas Secretary of State in November 2018. As Secretary of State, Scott has placed priority on providing support and guidance to county election officials, improving the office business filing system to ensure it is compatible with industri industry software, implementing cutting edge IT security, and making it as easy as possible to register and cast a ballot in Kansas without compromising election security. Scott and his wife, Michelle, reside in Overland Park with their children. Next, I'd like to introduce Fred Sherman. Fred has over 25 years of experience in municipal and county government planning and administration. He currently serves as the Deputy Election Security Commissioner for Johnson County. Fred previously was the Chief Administrative Officer and City Clerk for the City of Westwood. Fred also held positions as Community Development Director for the City of Gardner, a City Planner for Overland Park, along with other roles with Miami County, Lawrence, and Olathe. Fred earned his Master's of City Planning from the Georgia Institute of Technology and his Bachelor's from the University of Kansas. Fred is a native of Lawrence and now lives in Olathe with his wife of 26 years, Susan, where they raised their two children, daughter Laurel and son Colin. Thank you, Scott and Fred, for taking time to share your experiences and hopefully answer any questions for those on this election update Zoom. Perfect, now we'll go ahead and throw it to Mr. Secretary. If you wanna just start giving us with a general update. Sure, um, first off, for all of you who voted in the primary, thank you for doing so. Hopefully it was a good experience for you. Um, for those of you who didn't, um, shame on you. Uh, um, that being said, I'm assuming most of you did because in 2018, when there was a contentious primary between then Governor Collier and Secretary of State Kobach, there was a high 20% turnout in that primary, and uh, like 25, 26%. And we were anticipating even higher this time with an open Senate seat. And we were right. We were expecting 27, 28%. It was closer to 35% turnout in the primary. And what we're seeing is 
more engagement, not just from Republicans across the state, but we're seeing more engagement from Democrats across the state as they're having more and more primaries, much like Republicans have had for decades. We're all familiar with how Republicans have a big fight out for it in primaries for positions for state house, state school board, and also for our congressional seats. But now we're seeing Democrats do the same thing, which is driving folks out to vote, which is a good thing because that's gonna get more engagement, all, not only in our November election, we believe, but we think that's also gonna trickle into next year's local elections. So we're hoping anyway, because we love to see that voter engagement. Um, obviously there's a lot more vote, um, vote by mail as you, or advanced uh, absentee votes that those terms have been thrown around. Uh, a lot of counties, often send an application to every voter. Sedgwick does it, Kelly County does it. Well, we told counties, we weren't gonna just mail a ballot to every address because our data is not that good. Um, and there's some security issues there because when we do a, a application to the voter and get that application in, they sign that application. When we get the ballot in it, the envelope is signed. We can compare those two signatures together to make sure that person actually filled out that ballot and we compare it to a government ID that's on file with that signature. So in Kansas, voting by mail is very secure because of that. Um, the one process we are concerned with voting in mail, which there is an uptick. Uh, in 2018, there was about 50,000 people that voted through the mail system. Uh, this last primary was over 350,000 people. And overwhelmingly, that was Johnson County. So we work well with post office. There wasn't any glitches or concerns with the post office. A lot of folks had heard that Wichita was gonna move some equipment out. Um, some employees there got upset, but we visited with the postmasters of all, almost all our post offices across the state because we deal with the mail, not only in elections, but on the business side. The, they were way below capacity and they were gonna repurpose those machines. I think it was to Cleveland that actually needed increased capacity, but then it got political and those machines are staying in Wichita. But we are no more concerned about the mail processing ballots than any other time, any other election year, regardless of the volume, because overall mail volume is not going up, even though there's more ballots going through the mail. So our concern is if you won a million dollar lottery ticket, would you mail it to Topeka? or would you drive it to Topeka? You know, that's our concern. Another anecdotal um, evidence of concerns with the mail that we do have on timing is the Postmaster General sent all secretaries of state a letter by priority mail, letting us know it's to, to encourage voters to allow seven days for their ballot to get to the county office. Well, the problem is, is I still haven't gotten that letter. It was sent July 25th, priority mail. So when the post office sends a letter that I can't even get from the post office, we're, we're really discouraging people. If you wanna get that advanced ballot, that's absolutely fine. Johnson County does a fantastic job of having, um, by their county election office, they have two giant uh, secure mailbox ballot boxes. You can just throw it in there, almost like a nighttime deposit box. If you can go to the post office, you can go to the county election office. I'll let Fred talk a little bit more about where other election um, about secure boxes are going to be in the county because that's more under his management. But we provided two drop boxes to every county with our CARES Act money to make sure that folks don't necessarily mail. I know there's some people you have no choice. You got to mail it. You don't have a care taker and you may be on your own. You may not be able to drive. I get it. But to the extent that you can put it in the county office, drop it at the drop box, drop it off at any polling place in the county on election day, or even at the early advanced places. You can just take it, drop it off. You won't even be there 10 minutes. So you don't have to worry about a contact if you do have concerns about exposure to uh, COVID. So those are some of the protective measures we've put in place, but we also didn't want to take away any voting options. So you can still vote in person across the state in your county for uh, early advanced in-person voting. And then also you can vote on election day at the polling place you're assigned to. So those are some of the things we wanted to make sure that, you know, I was really frustrated. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna use stronger language. I was irritated and angry at Governor Parsons in Missouri during their local election. He said, if you're scared to vote, don't vote. Your safety is more important than anything. And it was grating to me because I was remembering that during uh, when we were able to liberate Iraq 
and they held their first election ever and they had to dip their finger in purple ink and the pride and celebration of these citizens of Iraq being able to have a say in their government for the first time, knowing that purple ink made them a target for terrorists, but they weren't scared. Why as Americans would we ever be scared to go vote because we might get sick? So let's put everything in perspective. If you are concerned about COVID, we've got some great options as it relates to that, to vote through mail and you can drop it off and you don't have to worry about an exposure that way. If you wanna vote in person, our, our election workers are wearing masks. We've provided plexi shields and hand sanitizers. And, and a lot of folks you have heard about the single individual use pen stylists. So not everybody's touching the machine. And I'll let Fred talk about some of the security measures they're doing specific to Johnson County's equipment. but. It's safe to vote. It, I'll, I'll tell you this, it is safer to vote in person than it is to go to the liquor store or to Walmart. And it's because of folks like Fred and his team making sure that it's safe and it's a pleasant experience. One other thing I wanna let folks know is when you do go to vote on election day, um, in a primary, there's a lot less unaffiliated voting, but in November, there's gonna be a lot more. And it may look like there's a long line at that polling place. It's not a long line. It's just we're encouraging people to social, social distance six to eight feet apart. And so that line may look like it's going out the door and it may take a long time to vote, but that line is moving incredibly fast. We just don't want people bunched up together because again, we wanna respect the CDC guidelines as it relates to voting. So a um, couple other things, just to let you know real quick, um, Republicans in the primary overwhelmingly voted in person. Uh, Democrats overwhelmingly voted through, through advanced ballots. However, Republicans were better at turning their ballots in at a higher rate than the Democrats were. So, and again, we have, a, if you want to know about your, if you, they've got your ballot, because you did mail it, you know, ballots go out, I believe, Fred, on the 15th, I believe. is the day, first day, on 14th, 14th, 15th. 14th. So, you, it, when you get your ballot in that mail, and as soon as you decide who you're going to vote for, try to get it in as quick as you can. Our website, sos.ks.gov, and I'll let Fred give the Johnson County website. You can track your ballot. You can track uh, if they got your application. You can track when the ballot was sent. You can track when the ballot was received. If it's getting close to Halloween and your ballot hasn't been received, you need to reach out to Fred's office because they're going to be the ones to make sure that you're, you're able to vote and get your vote counted. If you, you, don't, you didn't see it coming up on election day and you want to go to a polling place and vote, you can get a provisional ballot. As soon as Fred team confirms that your mail ballot was never received, that provisional ballot's going to count. So Kansas does a fantastic job making voting simple, a lot of options, safe, and also just making it an enjoyable experience. I cannot brag enough on what Fred and Connie have done in Johnson County. Um, as a matter of fact, they were disappointed with the way they performed on election night. Here's why. They wanted their final results, results posted by 9 p.m. They were posted by 9.07 p.m. Um, and that was only because a polling place had a longer line and they wanted to make sure all the folks in the line voted. So Johnson County is becoming the standard of a quality election office. And I can't brag on them enough. Uh, Connie has, you know, done a great job raising the bar in the office and letting Fred know what those standards are. And here's a nice thing about Fred is in, I was talking to somebody from Olathe um, this past week, Tim Dannenberg, a lot of you know him. He said he's the most non-political person he knows. He just wants to get his job done. And that's one of the reasons why we we're excited him um, accepting the job. And he's going to do a fantastic job for hopefully decades going forward in the county election office. So with that, I'll hand it back to you guys until you have questions for me. Perfect. Thank you. Why don't we go ahead and lead into with Mr. Sherman? Sure. Thank you. And again, uh, let me give you a little more uh, details perspective on my position here in Johnson County Election Office. Again, my uh, title right now is Deputy Security Election Commissioner. Um, I'm actually uh, kind of put it on the understudy in 2020. Um, Connie Schmidt is actually the election commissioner here in Johnson County in 2020. And Connie was the uh, election commissioner here in Johnson County from 1995 to 2005. And during that 10 period, 10 year period of time, um, through Scott, Secretary Scott Schwab's leadership, uh, Connie was convinced to come back and kind of help lead the office here through the 2020 election cycle. And uh, uh, it's been a great thing. And I, I could not ask for a better situation. If I was like a football or a basketball coach, it's like having a Hall of Fame coach come in and show me how to basically X and O. So it's like having 
Bear Bryant or John Wooden kind of show me how to game plan. So I'm in a really great situation. And a lot of the success we've had this year is really due to Connie Schmidt's implementation coming into it. And again, my role is basically understudy uh, for the 2020 year to where potentially I'll be nominated in 2021 to be the election commissioner. So that's a little bit of perspective in terms of, you heard the name Connie and Fred and, and what I'm doing here today. In terms of Johnson County, yes, we did have a very successful election here in August. Um, it was challenging, like it's been challenging for everybody in, in the world of COVID-19 and the pandemic. I've had staff here say they've conducted elections in uh, blizzards and snowstorms and without electricity and anything like that, but no one has ever had to conduct an election in a worldwide pandemic. So it's brought on a lot of different challenges and nuances and kind of uh, different aspects that we've had to deal with. Um, and it, and it's it's been uh, and it, it's been a, it's been a, a challenge in terms of trying to determine what the next chapter is going to be in terms of how we're going to process. Um, back when the pandemic hit, and we had the stay home order back in March and April. We didn't even know if we could have polling sites. There was a lot of discussion at that point in time. Would it be all by mail? Do we do in person? Or those kind of things. Um, but you know, actually through the Secretary of State's leadership, we have maintained. As you indicated, there's a lot of options for Kansas voters to vote. So we here in Johnson County have been able to do election sites on polling day. We do advanced voting sites and we have done a process this year uh, with advanced by mail. Um, advanced by mail applications have been available in Kansas really since the mid 1990s. Um, any uh, registered voter has been able to request uh, an advanced ballot by mail, but they have to make an application each election cycle to do so. As Scott mentioned earlier, some counties have chosen to promote that uh, aggressively, like uh, Central County and Douglas County in years past have always sent out applications to the registered voters to allow them to vote by mail. In Johnson County, we've not done that in the years past. We have really relied on advanced, pretty much in-person voting uh, traditionally here in Johnson County. Um, in August, we had seven sites opened up for advanced voting locations. And Additionally, if you look at our numbers in the past elections, we've gotten trended up to where almost half of our voters have voted in advance in person um, as opposed to election day. And that trend we think will continue, but we did decide back in um, April, um, because again, the pandemic and the stay home order at that point in time, to send out applications to uh, every registered voter in Johnson County to allow them to apply to vote by mail. And we received them back by the tens of thousands. In fact, in August, uh, we processed 106,000 mail-in ballots here in Johnson County, which is about right about third of the uh, county or the state total for mail-in ballots. Um, and that was uh, traditionally in most years we would do only about 40 to 50,000, so it kind of doubled our number of mail-in ballots. And we anticipate getting a large number of mail-in ballots as well for the, the November election. We have some staff and volunteers right now processing the application. As uh, Scott mentioned, it's a very secure process where every voter has to provide their uh, signature, their information, their ID. That is then verified to their voter registration record. That's just to receive a ballot. Then once the ballot's mailed back out, it comes back. And again, that is also verified with their identification, uh, their voter ID, and their signature, just like if they're checking in a person. So it is a very secure process. So here in Johnson County, like it's happened through the state, there's really many avenues for people to participate in the voting process. Um, on election day in August, we had 167 polling locations on election day. Um, we're going to increase that number here in November. Um, we're still finalizing some of those polling sites this week. We'll probably have about 175 to 178 polling locations on election day. Um, we had seven advanced voting sites uh, in August. Uh, we will have, right now we finalized eight and we're still working on the contract for a ninth one as well. So hope to announce that next week once we get that contract finalized. Um, those advanced voting locations will be opened um, actually three weeks in advance. We're going to open it on October 17th, all the advanced locations. So every voter will have three weekends, three Saturdays to vote ahead of time. Um, and again, at those advanced voting locations, anyone who does a mail-in ballot, they can drop them off as well. The final thing that Scott mentioned as well is the drop-off boxes for vote by mail. Um, we do have two secure boxes here at the election office, but we are securing seven additional drop-off boxes uh, to place throughout the county. Um, again, we're finalizing those locations. They'll be primarily at county library facilities, and we're working with our facilities people to make sure the security cameras and all that aspects is in place uh, to monitor those drop-off locations. And again, next week, we, we plan to kind of do our, our final press release and public announcement of all the events, voting locations, and the drop-off boxes for the November election. So, 
we're working up to the process. We're gearing up for a successful election. Um, we do anticipate record numbers, just like we saw in August, and we think it's going to be a very exciting and challenging time. But again, we are striving to have a very successful election day and again, try to get our uh, results posted out on time by 9 p.m. Wonderful. Thank you both. So if it's okay now, we have a couple questions for you guys. Um, and you guys can decide if it's more of a general or if it's more um, county specific. But the first one, and I, and I feel like you've answered this, um, but we do have some uh, attendees wondering. So we've been doing mail-in ballots for years. I think you said since the 90s. Um, so you guys are confident going into this, this general election that a mail-in ballot is safe and a secure way to get your vote in. Is that correct? Yes, and, and I speak for Kansas on this because, you know, different states have different ways of doing things like Washington, they just send a ballot to everybody and that's a different process and I don't know that process. And I've talked to Kim Wyman, whose husband's actually from which or Hutchison, Kansas, um, about that. But in Kansas, to go through the process, you, you print off the application. And then you're going to send that to the election office. And actually, to be honest with you, my son got COVID in July. And so I knew I was going to be quarantined getting into the election. So I just took an image of the application and texted it directly to Connie. I'm like, Connie, I need a, I need a ballot sent to my house. It was really easy. Filled out the application, wrote down my driver's license. The ballot came in the mail at the appropriate time. Again, I filled out the right side, the, the outside of that envelope, and make sure you sign that envelope. If you don't sign it, you're going to have to go down to the county office and sign it. And that's just an inconvenience. We don't want to have to put voters through. Um, if somebody sends your ballot in for you, there's a section on that envelope where they need to fill out. We encourage folks, especially seniors, take a picture of that because if someone, if your ballot doesn't go and that person never turned in your ballot and they were supposed to, they've committed a crime. So now we have evidence of who that person was. But we encourage folks, don't give your ballot to anybody you would not give your checkbook to. Your ballot is not insured. Your ballot is your responsibility. So we really encourage folks to make sure that they uh, take very good care of their ballot. And again, those drop boxes all over the place, plus the increase in person voting places in, in, in Johnson County, it's not going to be very difficult at all trying to go out and, and put that ballot in. There is one other thing I want to address though, as it relates to these. There's an organization on the Missouri that's mailing a lot of folks um, applications for advanced ballots and it is causing massive confusion because Johnson County already sent applications out and they've got them. Then all of a sudden they get another form in the mail and we've seen other people send application and voter registration forms out in some some of them they're asking for information you don't even need to be giving. So unless it comes from the county or it comes from our office, which we rarely send anything to voters, throw it in the recycle bin. Um, and if you're concerned about anything you get in, in the mail, you can reach out to Fred's office because they're real good about making sure what's fraudulent and what's not. If you filled out your application, check online first before you fill out another one because we don't know if they're just doing data collection, if it's intentional to confuse voters. Our office is getting a ton of calls on them. I can't imagine how many phone calls Fred's office is getting. Not too many. Again, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something Two we're dealing basis, with. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty frustrating. We're looking at anything we can do to a cease and desist. Um, the organization is not even filed with our office as an entity in Kansas. So, you know, later on we can segue that into foreign influence in the elections because that's a nice segue into that after a bit, but I'll see what other questions you have first. Fred, do you have anything else on that? No, I, you know, part of it is the, uh, the mail-in ballots, the, they are actually live ballots. So if an individual does mail out a ballot and they receive it, it's going to be that voter's responsibility. That is a live ballot. Um, that's not a sample ballot. You know, they, they, if they, they request a mail-in ballot and go to a polling location, they're going to be coming up as an advanced voter and will need to vote provisionally. We had a lot of people that just said, oh, I left it at home or lost it or whatever. And the other component, as Scott indicated, you got to make sure you follow the instructions of them to put your ballot in your envelope and you sign it. We have situations where husbands and wives swap it or they sign the wrong envelope. It comes with a specific envelope and that process of filling out that envelope and signing is just the same as you're voting in person. So yes, it is a very secure process in Kansas where 
Um, you go through almost a three-step process of, of uh, applying for it, that goes to a security check, then the ballot's sent, and that goes through a security check. So it is a very secure process, but it's only secure if the voters follow the procedures in terms of putting their particular ballot in their envelope, they sign it, and they return it. Um, believe it or not, we have a lot of the confusing factors of that aspect of where people will put in um, the ballot in a different envelope that invalidates it. We'll have people that hole punch their ballot or those kind of things. So it is specific in terms of how they have to mark their ballot and those kind of things. Um, but it is a secure process and we are seeing um, this year with the COVID-19 record numbers here in Johnson County as well as across the state of people applying for vote by mail. You know, I'm glad you guys brought up the Springfield, Missouri, because that was actually a question. Um, we did have somebody that received something from Springfield, Missouri um, in Kansas. So I'm glad that you addressed that. So thank you for that. So my next question, um, and, and I love that you brought up foreign influence too, because that is on my list as well. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, with the mail-in ballot, you both mentioned there is a website that you can track. How can individuals track, um, track their ballot? So on our, I'll let, get, let Fred give his website here in a second. Our website is sos.ks.gov. Click on the elections tab and all the information and tools, you'll see it right there. Katie, our comms director in our office and our IT has been working tirelessly to update our website and also update the election night website. So hopefully everybody liked the look and feel of that in August. We'll have a few more enhancements in November, but that's the easiest way to track it is there. If, you, if you're not computer savvy, I understand when I get a new cell phone, I give it to my 16 year old to set up. Um, if, if, if you just struggle navigating the internet for one reason or another, you can also call the county office. I gotta tell you, the Johnson County office is very consumer friendly. They don't look at it as a citizen calling. They don't look at it as, a, as someone, a voter calling. They're looking at it as a customer. You know, the people in Johnson County are customers to the Johnson County election office and they have great customer service there. Fred, I'll let you do your website. Sure, let me show it to you. I've got it, let's share my screen here on the, on the site. Um, Actually, that's the link there, and it actually links to the Secretary of State's uh, website um, for their voter lookup, their voter review. It is live, it's dynamic. Once the uh, application has been processed to receive the mail ballot, it'll be updated instantaneously. Um, we have staff and volunteers working on the applications currently. Uh, I think as of this morning, we had over 80,000 applications already processed. Um, we anticipate being well north of uh, 100,000, probably close to 120, 130,000 when it's all said together. But this johnsoncounty.org slash voter review um, site will take uh, voters to the Secretary of State's link where there they can look up their registration, their voter history, um, sample ballots will be posted to that site as well once we get those uploaded. And then again, they'll be able to check the status if they did apply for um, advanced by mail applications. So it'll show if their application has been registered. Uh, once the ballot has been sent out, that'll be noted on them. When the ballots come back, that'll be registered. And once it's been actually tabulated or processed, that'll be another thing that we be, voters will be able to track um, their ballot at this Johnson County or Johnson, J-O-C-O election.org slash voter review is the, the link there. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. We appreciate it. Um, so another question that we had, let me make sure I'm reading this right, was if they requested a mail-in ballot for November, how can they verify that they will receive one before it's too late? And I think you've answered that. Is that just called the Johnson County? Yeah, through the Secretary of State's website or through that link that I provided, we'll take them to the same database where they will be able to call their specific voter registration information. And if they registered and have been processed for a ballot, they'll be able to track the status of that ballot. Perfect. Now, if someone sends in a mail-in ballot and they do not receive verification, do you encourage them to go vote in person as well? Well, there's two things you can do. If it's getting close to Halloween and Fred's office hasn't received your ballot, the first thing I would do is call the office and say, hey, I've asked it, I haven't got my ballot, or you haven't received my ballot, and they can identify the problem and work that problem. And again, hopefully you're not sending it in the mail to get back to the office, you can use that Dropbox. Um, but you can vote in person, and again, it will be a provisional ballot. And then as they go through the t tabulation process after election night, they start weighing which 
which uh, provisional ballots or partial provisional ballots are worthy of being counted through the election board. And if they never did receive your mail ballot, then that ballot you cast on election day will actually count. So Kansas does a great job of doing everything we can to make sure your vote counts. So, um, but again, the best thing to do, if you put it in a secure drop box, it's going to get counted. Um, some things about mailing it that I forgot to mention before that are pretty important is it's got to be postmarked by election day. So if, if it's not, if the post office doesn't postmark it, that ballot's not going to count. Um, if it's received after the 6th, that ballot's not going to count, even if it was postmarked on election day. So there's certain things you want to make sure. That's why we encourage people, if you have to mail it, get it in right away. And if, it, if they get it in the office before election day and it's not postmarked, Fred's office can address that with the voter before election day. Right. So what is not mentioned, as Scott, Scott alluded to it, the people who vote by mail um, if it is a, has a valid postmark, we can receive and process it up to three days after the election day. Um, so we, even though you, kind of the story will be, if there's a close race on election night, the race is not over. We're still processing uh, ballots, mail-in ballots at Johnson County and throughout the state. So those ballots that have a valid postmark but are received on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday after the election day do count to be processed and are tabulated. As Scott mentioned, if a voter did apply for advance by mail and didn't receive it and votes in person, they will be given a provisional ballot. And that provisional ballot really is a safety net. And as we go through the process before we present the, uh, the, the ballots to the board of canvases, the canvassers is, um, we ensure to make sure that no one double votes to see if that, that mail ballot came in either before election day, on election day, or those three days after. If it has not come in and someone voted provisionally, then that is recommended to the board of canvas to count that in-person vote. Um, but if it, they voted twice, obviously, then it's not recommended to do it. So there are a lot of checks and balances systems into it. But keep in mind the timeline of this process, because it's all paper. This is all paper. we got to touch everyone and process everyone. And it takes resources. It takes people. It takes um, process. It, 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 is, it, is, it is a logistical nightmare to some extent. But um, we're working through with it. And again, if there's a close race on election night. Stay tuned. Those mail-in ballots may tip the scales one way or the other that are coming in after the election night. Wonderful. Um, so this this next question um, is basically just clarification on kind of what you guys just said. Are you guys then recommending that if they send a mail-in ballot to go ahead and go in person and have a provisional ballot? Are you recommending that they're asking or are you recommending they should call first and double check and hear that way? The first thing is to call the office. The first thing is to call the office because they may have some solutions for you then besides going in. It is an option to vote in person, but I would, I, and Fred, you can speak for your office, but generally the clerk's offices across the state, they want that phone call first to identify the problem. Fred, I'll let you do, say what work, works best for the Johnson County office. Yeah, same, same process as Scott indicated, you know, um, it does cause confusion and it does create additional um, process and work. You know, if they do vote twice and through the, the provisional process is an option, um, so if people are really concerned and they want to do it, yes, that option is available to them. Um, but, you know, there is the vast, vast, vast majority of the mail-in ballots do get processed on time and through the process of it. Um, but again, when it goes in the U.S. mail system or whatever, um, there is a chance. Just like that indicated, if you have a, a lottery ticket, you're going to take it in hand and kind of process that standpoint. Um, the web access to basically monitor your specific ballot is probably the key information Either this is the Secretary of State's website or that link I provided earlier, where you can track your specific ballot and see specifically when it's sent to you and when it's back and received and when it's processed. Um, so that is the, the best source of information for an individual voter to track the status of their specific ballot. Wonderful. Okay. Um, do you guys begin counting mail-in ballots before election day and have an idea um, what the, what the final result might look like. <laughs> well, let me, let me address that. We do not count them. Under state statute, we're not allowed to tabulate anything until under 7 p.m. on election day. Um, but actually, the state statute does allow us to process them where we basically will um, check them in, we'll check the voter, we will go through a process of opening and flattening them and actually scanning them in and store digital images of them because they all need to be processed. And if we waited till 7 p.m. election day to not even open them, 
it would be a nightmare in terms of the time it would take place. But there is no tabulation. You see no numbers, either from a vote in mail or even people who vote in person in advance. Those are done uh, before election day. So no numbers are tabulated until after 7 p.m. after the polls close on election day. Um, the votes that are come in by mail before election day are processed just like a voter who votes in person at an advanced site. The, the ballot is cast, it's processed, they're checked in as a voter, um, but there is no tabulation done. And the purpose for that is, again, let's say um, Fred's office gets, gets a ballot that's not signed. It gives them time to work with that voter to come in and sign that and verify a signature. Or if a signature doesn't match, it gives them a chance to verify some of that thing. Or if there's information that's missing. Yeah. Or if their um, address not, is wrong or something like that. Yeah, but they, they, they're not looking at the ballot itself. And that's, that's by law and that's under oath. And so, but we do want to, again, those processes are in place to make sure your vote actually gets counted. We don't want to find out on November 1st, for November 5th, you didn't sign your, the envelope on your ballot and have to get you to come down then. As much, much of those problems they can address on the front end before election night helps. On election night, around 730, you see our map give you some preliminary numbers. Those numbers are the advance in person voting and the mail ballots that were counted that day up at that point. So, um, and then later on the night, sometimes they give you a second number, but then they give you a full final number. It used to be, we asked um, clerks to give us three numbers throughout the night. We've changed that to say, if you want to do three, that's fine. But on your final one, make it, just let us know what your final number. So we don't, um, we don't assume there's more numbers coming in. We know you're actually wrapping it up for the night. Um, and again, in, in the situation with Johnson County, they got the early advanced vote in before eight o'clock posted and then a little over an hour they were done. Wonderful. Okay. Um, still, still surrounding mail-in ballots. Um, someone heard about a voter getting a vote by mail ballot from an outside source before they received an official one from the county. Then they reportedly received a third one. Is there any truth to this? Perhaps this is the Springfield, Missouri? Well, or now let, this is where people get confused between the application and the ballot. Um, if, if you may have got something that looked like a ballot, that's not a ballot at all. If it doesn't say official ballot on that envelope, it's not a ballot. And if it doesn't have the Johnson County Election Office, it's not, it's not a ballot. However, a lot of third parties from both the political parties, um, the League of Women Voters, a lot of third parties mail out applications. And it, it just, it's just a process because it's a public document. They're going to send it. A lot of folks want to push that. I know when I first ran for the legislature and I was going door to door, I always kept some of those applications on hand in case someone says, oh, that reminds me, I need to fill out my application for a mail ballot. I could hand it to them right there. But a lot of folks get confused that when they get the application in the mail, they say it's a ballot. And we see it on the internet all the time. People are sharing, hey, look, I got five mail-in ballots, two of which are my kids that moved away. No, those aren't ballots. Those are applications. And if you tried to fill that out on behalf of your child, one, you're breaking the law. Two, you better be good at imitating their signature. And three, you better have their driver's license number on there. So it's really difficult to try to compromise an election and essentially cheat because an application came to your house of someone who doesn't live there anymore, which is why that application process is so important. Fred, what do you got to add to that? You know, exactly. You know, in Kansas, again, it's a very uh, secure and regimented process where a, an individual has to make an application for advance by ballot for every election. And again, the process we do is once that application comes in, we verify that, that, red, that voter's um, identification and their signature to the signatures on record. Um, in fact, we are scanning those in to get updated uh, signatures. Signature recognition is, is, a, is a challenge uh, because, of, you know, as people age, particularly the uh, elderly, their, their handwriting gets to be difficult. And I'd say it, the younger generation today, they're not a paper and pen type of people. Um, when you sign these documents, when you sign this application or you sign your ballot, that's a legal document. And just like when you're signing your mortgage papers, you sometimes take a little more uh, meticulous uh, attention to making your signature look good. Um, so it, it is a challenge in terms of doing it, but it, it, every, every application, every voter, every ballot is being processed and evaluated 
and, and recognized. So it is a very secure process um, in terms of, of that process of, of ensuring that one voter cast one ballot. Wonderful, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, so now we're gonna kind of change topics um, and we're gonna move on to election workers. So there's been some discussion this year that um, with COVID, maybe there is a need for election workers um, because a lot of the volunteers were older. Is there any um, truth to this? And if someone was interested in volunteering for an election worker, what is the process for that? So all about election working. Well, we launched, um, we were very concerned and the, the clerks across the state raised concern about the, the more elderly population because we had a lot of retirees volunteer to work on, uh, election, uh, on elections. And, and according to Kansas law, you don't have to be 18 to work at the polls. You could be 17 or 16 years old. So over a year ago, our office launched a program in, in conjunction with the state school board uh, called Student Serve. And a student, and it's not a mandate, but it's strongly encouraged that if if a student wants to take the day off from school on Tuesday to go work at the polls and do the training, they're going to get paid. And if they write a paper, they can get credit. Here's the other thing. Like my son's 16 and he's filling out his application reluctantly to be a poll worker, but he's going to love it when he's done. And here's what's so magical about this. And, and Johnson County has been really good about getting youth to work elections. When you see a 16 year old working with an, the uh, senior on the technology it takes for in Johnson County to pull off an election, it's magical. It is just so fun to watch these two bookends of our generation work together. So to increase that we uh, created a universal application on our website that folks can go to again, it's sos.ks.gov, click the elections tab, and there's an application there. And then if you go to Facebook, a lot of times you'll see the, the, the toolbox for elections. So we tied that application to that. In three days, we got 1,100 applications for people to be poll workers in the state of Kansas, to the point where some counties are saying, okay, stop, stop, we've got, we've got plenty. Um, we, my goal was to recruit 210 across the state. That'd be two, poll, two more poll workers per county. And we've got 1,100 that we're disper dispersing those applications out to the county. So it looks like we've had a positive response. We told folks, if you're a poll worker and you're not going to be this time, recruit two people to replace you, whether it's your child or your grandchild. And I know Fred's had some initiatives too. Yeah, we, we've had really good luck. Um, you know, back in actually January, February, the office here sent out uh, letters to people who'd worked in the past to come and work on the past August election. And this was pre-pandemic, pre-COVID-19. And we had about a thousand people respond back at that point in time saying, yeah, we'll work in August. And then COVID-19 hit. And so we asked them again, and, and we had about 20% of that, that population drop out. So we had about 800 people um, request, you know, say, yeah, I'll, I'll consider it. There was a lot of trepidation, a lot of concerns. There were a lot of uh, people at high at risk individuals, but we had um, probably almost 150 new poll workers apply in August. As Scott indicated, the, uh, the interest has been overwhelmingly positive for November. We've had north of almost 1,800 people apply here in Johnson County to be a poll worker. Uh, for November. Um, again, to that point where we don't want to say, no, we don't need any more. Our challenge is going to be trying to train all these folks in a uh, safe social distance environment. So we're going to do them 40 people at a time. So we're going to probably have uh, between 40 and 50 poll worker training classes, uh, three a day, probably happening in the month of October. Um, so yes, it's been very good to get people engaged. There's great interest. Um, people are very interested in this November elections. So we've had overwhelmingly um, a large number of people apply to be poll workers. To do so, there are links on our website um, to through that process. Again, you do need to go through some mandatory training to be a poll worker. It's not just show up on election day. It is a long, hard day. We're gonna ask our poll workers to show up to the election sites at 4.30 a.m. Our polls will open at 6 a.m. and Connie is, is adamant that they need to be there 90 minutes prior to uh, election day uh, opening. Um, so it is a long day. They'll be there until after 7 p.m. and we don't allow people to come and go. So it is not easy work, um, but we've had great response and uh, we're looking forward to meeting all these new poll workers and training them and giving them the opportunity to be involved in the civic aspect of this. Well, that is wonderful news to hear, gentlemen. That's, that's great. Okay, so my other question is with all these uh, volunteer poll workers and of course people going into the poll. So we talked a lot about mail-in ballots. So now we're at the polls. I know this year there was a stylist. 
Um, what are some different precautions or um, things that you guys have implemented this year because of COVID? Well, we, we got millions of dollars through the CARES Act. And so the next question you get when you get the money is, what do you do with it? Um, Sandy in our office, who handles HR and purchasing, was able to get some various vendors together to create a PPE kit. And we sent two per polling place to the counties. And it's a, it's a big, like a vinyl or a cloth bag that you can unzip. There's two plexi shields, even a screwdriver to put them together. And it comes with hand sanitizers, masks, and, um, and uh, masks, sanitizers, shields, gloves. gloves, gloves. I knew there was something I was missing in there. And we sent that through to all the counties and that was about a million dollars to deploy those. But what was nice is the um, shields and the cases were not single use. So they can put them back in there when they're closing down the polling place and take them back to the election office to use again in November. So that was going to save some money and create a safe atmosphere for those voting at the polling place. And then what we also did is we asked the counties, you come up with a plan of what you need. And then the least the county would get was 5,000. And then we put a ceiling on it because it was based on polling places. And we came up with a, a formula of polling places and registered voters and voter turnout. And we had to put a cap on counties like Sedgwick and Shawnee and Johnson County, or else they were going to get 90% of the money. And we didn't want that to happen because there's these other big counties like Cowley County is the 15th largest county in the state, but yet they don't have the resources of a Johnson County to continue to buy equipment for uh, pandemic type style voting. So so we were able to give them money. Some counties said they just didn't need it. They didn't even need the $5,000 simply because they just didn't have the population or the concerns and they had no problem having shields and whatnot on their own. So we were able to repurpose that money to some other counties that were needing it. Plus the governor's allocated a lot of CARES Act money to the counties and if they need more money, they are allowed to go to their county commission asking for more money to help with this election. So that's what we did on our end, also um, using some of that money for the drop boxes, the various counties. And then we just are reimbursing Johnson County for some of the additional things they've done. And I'll let Fred talk about some of the things they've done on the county level. So yeah, the styluses were a big hit. I mean, actually, that was kind of the coveted thing. And it basically was able to implement what's called a touchless voting process, where a voter was able to come in and use that single use stylus, which is an ink pen on one end and had a rubber tip on the other end, uh, for them to sign in at the poll pads. Um, if they voted through the uh, express votes or the voting machines, they can use that stylus to make their, their votes as well. The one thing we did here in Johnson County that we hadn't done in the past is we basically um, gave every voter the option of whether they want to use the machine or vote on paper ballots. Um, we have always had paper ballots, but we've never kind of processed that. We didn't know if people would feel comfortable using a touch machine that other people have touched, even though they're using a stylus. We did train our poll workers to go through a process of actually sanitizing those machines between every vote. And that's a challenge. We had to work with the vendor to make sure we get the right products because these are computers and you don't spray uh, liquids on your computer screens aspect of it. So we trained our voting, our voting workers through a process of when they check in a voter, they had either an option of voting on paper, which is basically only the uh, voter touches that paper, or they can go through the process of using the uh, voting machines, the touchscreen machines, using that stylus aspect of it as well. One of the challenges we ran into though, is traditionally with our machines, they typically were only in past spaced about three or four feet apart. And in the social distancing world we live in now, we had to space them out six feet or further um, so we had to buy some additional extension cords and those kind of things to get our voting machines put in greater distances apart. What that meant at some polling locations, though, is we only have half as many machines as we had in the past. So again, by using paper ballots, um, we were able to use those portable voting booths. We can put them anywhere with a lot more flexibility. In short, we gave voters a lot of options um, for it, and we got great response back, particularly with those, those, those the dual use styluses. Those were a big hit. Um, we almost ran out at some polling locations in August, so we're going to make sure we have enough uh, supplies at every polling location coming up here in November. Wonderful. All right, so now we're going to move on to foreign influence. So a lot of people, <laughs> Mr. Schwab, I saw that. <laughs> um, a lot of people think living in Kansas that it may not apply to them. So I guess, um, first of all, is it an issue in Kansas? And what are some things that you're seeing and how can we combat that, of course? Well, if foreign influence comes in two, two different forms. Um, there's, you know, influence on trying to attack computer systems and things like that. And so we're constantly working with Homeland Security and the National Guard and the FBI and CISA to make sure that our 
systems are secure. And I'm in the fusion center, or what I like to call the lockbox at the National Guard in Topeka, often getting security briefings. We share our logs with uh, the National Guard so they can go through to see who's trying to access our system, have they got through, and what updates we need to do to protect our, our poll book, our online poll book. Um, but influence also comes through social media. Uh, there was a situation, Stacey Abram, Abrams down in Georgia was the Democrat nominee running for governor against Kemp. There was a picture of her taken with a SUNY and it said, vote Abrams. Someone photoshopped it and said, Georgia Communist Party, um, Muslim Brotherhood. That wasn't originally on the sign. I believe that was generated by the state of Iran. So when somebody saw that on Facebook, it struck an emotion and they shared an image that was created by a foreign nation for people to actually believe. And so that's where we're seeing a ton of influence. Some other things there was in Houston back before the Floyd incident, when we had Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter in Houston, they created a, we're gonna have a, a Blue Lives rally on such and such a date in Houston, and then we're gonna have a Black Lives Matter such and such a date in Houston on the same street at the same time, trying to create chaos. Luckily, it was a peaceful event that ended up being nothing violent, but there was an attempt, and that was, that was based out of uh, North Korea, I believe. There was another one that the um, Westboro Baptists were gonna uh, protest in downtown Lawrence, Kansas. So there was a fake Facebook post that was saying LBGTQ, we're going to protest same time, same place. That was by a foreign nation sponsored by a government. So yes, Kansas is a target. It's not very often we have an open Senate seat, but foreign nations have a dossier created on Barbara Boyer and Roger Marshall. They definitely had one on Pompeo because they thought at one time he may jump into this race. So yeah, we are taking foreign influence seriously. While the last six months we talked more about COVID, um, our office understands that we have to deal with COVID, but the other half of our bandwidth is trying to make sure we're securing our elections against foreign influence. So our National Association of Secretaries of State has created a hashtag. It's called Trusted Info 2020. If you see an article or a picture or something that you really want to share because it's something you agree with or you disagree with, you can go to that hashtag and check and see if it's actually true or not. And we're letting folks know what false articles are out there. And here's how, here's how tricky they're becoming. Everybody's heard of nytimes.com, newyorktimes.com. There, there was a foreign nation that created a domain, nytimes.co, C-O. There was no M at the end. So if you have eyes like mine, I'm assuming it's the New York Times. And it was the same article that you'd see in the New York Times. But over time, those two articles would start to deviate. And before long, you're sharing an article that's completely false and was sponsored by a foreign nation. So we're encouraging folks, and I liken it to our neighborhood. If I had a neighbor come up to me and say, hey, do you hear the guy across the street's having an affair? I'm not sharing that. None of my business, not part of the solution, not part of the problem. And I may have the conversation with him to verify it, but I'm still not sharing that. If you see some of these articles on Facebook that see, especially with headlines today being so extreme, don't fall to an, if you're emotionally wanting to share something on Facebook or Twitter, that's when you really need to check yourself and check the source. And when in doubt, don't share it. That's the safest thing, because we don't want our, our elections being determined emotionally on who people are going to vote or what to believe by what foreign nations say for or against a candidate. It's already known that Russia right now is trying to pump up um, President Trump and trying to uh, increase the negatives on Biden. China, it's the opposite. They're trying to increase the positives on Biden and decrease um, the positives on Trump. We don't want that to be the part of the debate. We want this, let's just keep this in our backyard. And even though the whole national stage is watching it, let's not be a tool for foreign nations simply because we saw something on Facebook that looked like something that was, you know, kind of cool or agreed with a narrative, I believe. So I'm just going to share it, even though it's, it wasn't true.
I was muted. I apologize. Well, that is wonderful inform uh, information to know, and um, I did not know about that in, in Kansas. So, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, well, Mr. Uh, Sherman and Mr. Schwab, thank you so much for your time. We've got one more question because we're, we're um, getting close to that hour. Is there anything based on the conversation that we've had today, is there anything that I did not ask or maybe that you have not had an opportunity to mention that you would like um, our attendants or our audience to hear about the general election coming up? Any last thoughts? Well, yeah, I think you know, the general theme is yeah, we're going to see a large turnout here in November. Um, and again, it has got a lot of interest. And in, in the COVID-19 situation and social distancing, there are a lot of challenges. So um, we are here in Johnson County going to be promoting vote early. You know, if you wait till election day, you may stand in line. Um, if we're going to have um, 13 days of advanced voting over three weekends, you can choose your time frame. You can do it when you can do it. We're going to really encourage folks to vote advance. Um, if you wait until election day, and a lot of people do, they get a lot of uh, adrenaline out of doing that. And we still have, I said, close to 180 polling locations on election day. But you may end up waiting in line or taking some time frame if there is a large turnout. So there are a lot of options. You can apply to vote by mail until uh, the latter part of October. You can vote in person um, or you can vote on election day. Um, but do be patient if you do wait till election day, particularly late in the day, you may see some long lines. Yeah, I want to throw out some deadlines that are pretty important for folks to know. Um, the last day to register to vote is the 13th. September 22nd is National Voter Registration Day. So we're just asking folks, wherever you go, if you go out to eat, you go to the grocery store, you're talking to a friend, just ask them, hey, are you registered to vote? And encourage them to get registered to vote. If you even want to keep a form on with you that day to hand to folks, that's a great way to go ahead and spread the word about, hey, this voter registration day, let's, this is your country register to vote. And even if you're not 18 yet, if you will be 18 on election day, you can register to vote now. Um, on the 14th, um, voting by mail and the advanced person may begin, but those ballots will be going out the 14th or the 15th. And then obviously on uh, November 2nd uh, at noon, early advanced in-person voting is done. The next day is election day and all mail ballots need to be received by the 6th. So the most important day, it's obviously, is October 13th. Make sure you get um, registered to vote by then. And then, obviously, make sure you, if you're doing a mail ballot, get it in by the 6th of November. That, that, and again, both of you all and our sponsor, thank you so much for having us on today and thank making you. sure we're kind of cutting through all the static noise about elections and mail ballots to just give folks the right information and encouragement because between what Johnson County is doing in their office and we're doing on state statewide level, you can trust the results that you're going to get in the election in 2020. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Brad, back to you. Well, great. We want to be respectful of everybody's time. Again, thank you, Secretary Schwab and Mr. Sherman, for your time this morning and the great information. Gentlemen, you did a great job. This isn't the first time you presented all this. You are doing a great job. We're in very good hands. So thank you. A uh, video of today's call will be available on our website, www.olatha.org. If not late today, it'll be early next week. So if you would need to view that again, it'll be available. Once again, we want to thank First National Bank of Omaha for sponsoring our call this morning. Latham, thank you for being with us this morning and uh, sponsoring again the, the call today. Thank you everybody for joining us today and everyone have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.